<laughs> okay, let's go ahead and get started. At least the yeah. Wow. Maybe it's a long word. Uh, okay. Um, there is two sign-in sheets, okay? And for those of you who your name is on here with the Wayne's program, if you pre-registered, uh, all I ask for you to do is just uh, initial it over here on the right-hand side. We're supposed to have a few non-members that were in the Wings program in here. Um, Bob's going to go out the front gate and check to see if they're up there, but we typically, I get a phone call from them saying, you know, uh, how do we get in or something like that. Uh, I haven't gotten any phone calls this time, uh, but we'll see what happens with that. Now, for the rest of you guys, or all of you guys, everybody that's a member of the club, of course, you know what to do with this one. That's so you get credit for internally with the Aero Club. If you want to be, you know, if you are part of the Wayne's program, then there's another sheet behind this sheet here that you can sign and put your email address and all that, and so you can get credit for this. If you're not a Wayne's program or not signed up to it, there is a, uh, over here where you put your initials over here on the far right hand side where you can say that you would like to be part of the Wayne's program. Um, for those of you that, you know, uh, and we talked to a couple of you already as to how you do that. You can just go online and, and sign up for it. Um, any questions? I'm going to start this going around and uh, you guys do need to sign too. Just down, you know, uh, and we'll get you guys going. I'm going to start this problem. I'll just start the video and just get it done. Yeah, that's the Wayne's sign-in sheet. Um, if you are registered, your name will be on that if you had pre-registered for this. If not, then for those of you who are in the Wings and are registered in the Wings program, it would really be appreciated if you could register for these meetings that we are having that are part of the Wings program because it makes my job a lot easier to sign you off. Otherwise, I have to sit there and search for you and do all that stuff. Okay. Um, okay. Well, Bob is out bellabatting around looking for people to scrape up to come in here. Um, what we do is usually what we do is have a, 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 an agenda at the beginning of the meeting. And uh, most of you have been here 100,000 times and know what I'm going to do. Uh, new people. We introduce new people. People that have either joined the club or have not been introduced before or showed up sometime later. Uh, uh, we have had people join the club and never have been to this meeting. So, is there anybody out there? I, most of you I recognize. Okay, new people. Tom Anderson, I joined about a month ago. Came to see some white training. I understand it's the best program around. Um, I live in Laquita. I work for the Sheriff's Department. Ride a motorcycle all day long. So. All right. Hopefully we haven't met before. <laughs> <laughs> so, glad to be here. Well, welcome to this club. All right, anybody else? Who else? New? By the way, my name is Roger Mann. You're old. <laughs> I know everybody here knows me. But yeah, I'm Roger Mann, who's uh, the safety officer for the Hero Club. And, uh, and then Bob Pierce, of course, is the manager who's the older guy that went out the door. <laughs> um, we do have our mechanic here, David G. <laughs> and, um, well, <laughs> and then we got Randy Ball, who's our, our T-34 expert. Uh, he does the check rights for T-34s. Dave will agree. We do have our own personal lawyer here, Andrew. <laughs> okay, do you anybody down there? No. Okay, great. Okay, anybody else wants to introduce themselves? 
as a new person. Okay, NIF not. Okay, new pilot ratings. Does anybody here? This includes solo. Okay? All right, come on, stand up. I know you've been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got my license and then I got checked out on the T41 fire. So. Okay. Nice. Right. <laughs> yeah, Chad, Chad had a kind of, what was it? You went for your check ride one day, but the winds were out of limits. Uh, it was uh, a couple weeks ago there. It was like that one Friday that was all rainy and overcast. Canceled the flying, got the car out of the way, and yeah. went back to the flying part. Yeah, the good part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we got a couple new formation guys. Okay, that counts too. Wang Chun, take a bow. He's our newest wingman with the fast oh. flying. talk to the Aero Club manager. He's going to talk shortly, right, real short. Okay. Well, yeah, don't talk about the subject yet until we get started on that. Um, okay, there is a couple of things that we need to do. Um, one of the things I neglected to bring up, too, how many here know where the bathrooms are? Most of you should. Yeah, it's just right out that door to your right, and it's in the foyer where you walk in. In case we have an emergency, like a giant earthquake, 10.0 or something like that, you can go out that door, that door, or you can go down the end of the hallway, and so that's there. You can go out that way, go out the front door, or you can continue all the way down to the other end of the building where there's another door you can go out. Or to the patio by the end of the building. Or, well, yeah. Yeah, patio kind of traps you inside the middle of the building. <laughs> it wasn't really ever kind of when I was working here as being an exit, so. Okay, and then we're going to talk about carburetor icing. Okay, not yet for you yet. Um, okay, we got a couple of people who want to talk. Dr. Foster, uh, this Dr. Foster here is from the FAA. So watch your P's and Q's. And, uh, and uh, he's here to watch Bob and I see if we do a good job or not. So, uh, <laughs> So, doctor, if you want to. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, just making rounds this evening. I'm Dr. Foster. I work at River Tri Fiesto, and I am the FAA Safety Team Program Manager. And I have 31 airports under my purview. Uh, I forget how many are private. And yes, I do go out and visit with them. Uh, if there's an airplane out there and if there's a body out there, I'll talk to them. I know you're probably thinking, does an airplane to talk to you? I sure do. <laughs> but I'll talk to airplanes, and they tell me a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, I'm here if you have any questions. Uh, those of you that, um, you know, as I was watching the wing thing go around, y'all were waving it off, okay? Uh, just a little plug for wings. That could be to your advantage 
only for this reason. Okay? If you happen to get involved in an incident or an accident, that is one of the areas that the inspectors in my office come to and they hand me the sheet and go, is this guy participating in the wing to go to safety programs? No, oh, okay, give me the sheet. No, hand it back and they go, mm, okay. And uh, when they go, mm, sometimes when you talk to the inspectors and you know you kind of want them to ease up on you a little bit, safety program kind of cushions it just somewhat. Not all the time though, but just somewhat. Most of you already know it's attitude that really cushions it. So, and then we do have compliance philosophy. So one of the things that we do now is we're all part of the safety team. So if you happen to be involved in something and one of the inspectors reach out to you, you know, please don't do what some people do and, you know, they go through that vocabulary that's just way in the back of the dictionary. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and, um, and then when they say, well, yeah, I want to participate in compliance philosophy, and when I read the report, and it says that the person was aggressive and belligerent and things of this nature, guess what? By compliance philosophy, you're no longer eligible. You know, so pass the word around. Watch what you say. Okay. Uh, any questions? Because I don't want to take their thunder. I, I want to hear what Bob has to say about the scripture part. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Thank you very much for showing up, and I'll, I'll be somewhere around. You, you said it'd be like that page does. Wonder around. Wonder around. <laughs> well, actually, I'm going to wander right here, and I'm going to sit here and wonder what y'all are doing behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, you want to go ahead and share uh, I have just one request from the controllers. Oh, was that the final thing? Yes. Yeah, we got it. Okay, sure. Base operations and ATC. So, um, some of you may have noticed uh, since 1 October we've had more air carrier traffic. Um, we've taken on a new mission, so we're moving um, soldiers uh, to and from uh, uh, Fort Irwin. So they're coming through here and then busing up there. So expect to see uh, that maybe uh, four or five times a year. Where one week at a time we'll just have a rush of air carrier traffic, maybe about 30, 40 aircraft. Okay, so um, one thing uh, with that is that that means it's mostly IFR traffic. So if you're flying to the south, uh, please um, get flight following from ATC and be in contact with them, especially if you plan on going anywhere near the Paris jump zone or crossing final for 3 2 because they could have an air carrier out there and they will have to respond to uh, resolution advisors. So you don't want to cause a, a TCAS event uh, just by flying out there and not talking to ATC. <coughs> ATC can provide you those advisors and tell you, hey, I got somebody on final on an instrument approach, I need you to kind of scoot a little over to the east or west and that should help them out. Okay, so but expect a lot more air carrier traffic here from now on. It's just we've got a new mission and uh, you know the Army has asked the uh, base to support that. Okay. Actually, that's exactly where my word Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> now, when you kind of drift over to the west, you might kind of need to watch out for the jump zone area. Jump zone and yeah. the final. Yeah, because so. yeah, remember, we got that jump zone out there. Most of you know that who's flying. And everybody in this room, for the most part, is flying a lot. Okay. Mr. Arrow Club Manager. Oh, yes. I'm back to cleaning the aircraft again. So those people who are flying the, uh, the 172, the 182, T-34s, most of those people uh, do a pretty good job. Don't forget when you're cleaning the windscreen, take and wipe the oil off uh, the fuselage, try and keep it clean because it is a club. Roger and I are not the uh, janitors. Uh, credit cards are getting better, however, we do have a gouge that sits above the credit card machine. If you got a, not sure what's supposed to be on your credit card when you fill out the slip, there's a little gouge up there, follow that. And I appreciate the help on that thing. Uh, for maintenance, 290 Foxtrot, we got uh, two cylinder changes and an annual on that aircraft. Uh, it's going to be delayed probably through uh, December maybe. Uh, hopefully maybe the third week we can get it back online um, on that one there. 5.7 is in for a 100 hour inspection, 234 whiskey pop-up. The rear throttle's got a short in the toggle switch for uh, the transpot, uh, for transmitting. 
However, the ICS works, and that's all you'll have if you're flying as an instructor in the back seat. So I don't recommend the instructor sitting back there and using 234 whiskey popper until we pull that throttle quadrant apart, and I say we as the maintenance people, uh, pull it apart and look at the wiring. It's, it's a cannon plug that's been, we've uh, disconnected totally. If anybody wants to use my handheld, whether in the back seat, the weather will come. <laughs> yeah. uh, five, six, uh, we need to send that in for, to the shop for a, a transponder. It does work in the air, but not on the ground. We don't know why. Uh, nine, six, we've got to have an, a VOR. You see the instrument or the radio for the VOR. The ILS works well on the second radio. So that's us do uh, go into the shop. I'll probably go into Chino. We'll have to call Advantage on that and make an appointment. And uh, 15, Fox, if I'm not mistaken, needs a VOR uh, update on that radio also. So I'm down to the Christmas party. I've sent out an email. I've gotten uh, three responses, which is not very good. How many people want a Christmas party like we've had in the past? I got one, two, three. OK, now the hands come up. Yeah, so we got two. How many you got? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, <coughs> ten, eleven, twelve. I've made reservations. Uh, no, I haven't made reservations yet. So um, if I don't get more, I'm not sure if it's even going to be worthwhile to try and do uh, that. The two areas I was looking at is Pinnacle Peak again uh, for the steakhouse or the uh, spaghetti factory out on uh, Mission, which is off the 91 in Riverside. Those two areas. If we do that, we should get reservations in pretty, pretty soon and uh, work on that. So I'm looking at dates now. Anybody have preferences where they want to go? How many want the steakhouse? How many want the spaghetti factory? So okay, we'll do the we'll do the steakhouse then. We'll do Pinnacle Peak. The dates. Uh, Sunday the third of December. The following Saturday, the following Sunday, which is the ninth and the tenth and the 18th and 19th of which is the following weekend, unless you want to do it midweek. Any preferences? Weekends. We're going to do a weekend. Okay, if I can't get reservations on a Saturday, which we've been very successful with, would you do it on a Sunday? <laughs> Start at 6 and we're done by 9 o'clock and that gives you time to get home and get ready for work. I mean, I understand that people down south and Tyler, which is out in Orange uh, Huntington Beach, it's a long drive for some people. Uh, and how about the weekend? I've got one requesting the third, one doesn't really care. I got two that really don't care for the weekend. Any preferences? First, second, or third weekend? Second, 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 second third. Saturday. Saturday or Sunday? Saturday, Friday. Saturday. Okay, so that's going to be the ninth. Is uh, the first, and then uh, the tenth will be the second choice, or the eighteenth, which is Saturday. Two Saturdays, or the or a Sunday night. I'm listening. Two Saturdays. Saturdays. Two Saturdays. Okay, the ninth and the eighteenth. We'll see if we can do a pinnacle peak. And it looks like uh, fifteen here. I'll make. Pardon? Seven or eighteen is a Monday. And I'll see nine and seven. That's right. So I got sixteenth. 16th and 17th. I don't have my phone here, I just guess real quick. So that'd be the 16th would be the Saturday and the 17th is Sunday. So we'll do Saturday's one. That's one and Sunday as number two. And I'm just going to make reservations for about 20 people right now. And I think we can probably fill those chairs. But we'll have a drawing like we've always had. We may give away some uh, free flight time, some prizes, who knows. I uh, haven't really decided. Uh, last year we had a pretty good turnout and we had some good prices. I think we gave away about three flight hours uh, for three drawings and uh, little trinkets, candy canes and all that good stuff. So anyway, okay, appreciate it. That's it. Okay. Um, well, we're going to talk about carburetor ice. Um, I'm not necessarily going to be talking about, you know, like regular icing on an airplane flying through ice uh, or cold, you know, below zero and all that kind of stuff, but 
I am going to talk about carberry rice because we do get it here in Southern California. You can get icing also on your wings and that type of thing. That does happen. But more likely we are to get carburetor icing more than anything. Uh, we've had several incidences where that has happened and one time about two years ago we had one guy leave an airplane up at Camarillo and it wasn't until after we picked it up and the engine ran perfect. Uh, so we'll get into that in just a minute. Okay, uh, the first scenario I got up here is uh, a flight instructor and the student were in a system 172, which is like our T41A, and working in a routine traffic patterns at their home airport. Uh, the student was performing before landing checklist when he became distracted and forgot to turn on the carb heat or descent. Has anybody done that? You don't want to admit it? Uh, uh, the instructor noted the error, but allowed the student to proceed without carb heat. After landing, the instructor took the controls and initiated a climb out, at which point the engine with noise changed and the airplane stopped accelerating. Only when the instructor applied full carb heat did the engine roar back to life. Second scenario, on the mid-June morning in western North Carolina, a flight instructor and the owner of a Cessna 182 ventured out for a training flight. A weather station 13 nautical miles to the southeast reported visual meteor meteorological conditions, VMC, with a temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit. We get that here, right? Actually today it was 80 degrees. Uh, and a dew point of 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Typically, we don't get that here in Southern California. The relative humidity was 28%. Shortly after departure, the engine lost power and the pilot attempted to stretch the power off glide to a nearby grass strip. The airplane impacted tree branches before it stalled and subsequently impacted the runway environment. The NTSB determined one of the probable causes of the accident to be carb icing that led to a loss of engine power. And the story continues. I've got up here several accidents, some of which was the NTSB said flat out it's carb, they, they did not use it, uh, proper uh, anti or carb ice procedures. Uh, some, it was like, uh, like here, they, they probably caused, but many, many accidents have been from people not knowing what to do with car ice. Uh, when I went for my private many years ago, man, it was a big thing. Uh, I won't tell you what years that was, it was a long time ago. Dr. Foster was probably just a little kid then. <laughs> I know Bob wasn't though, but uh, it was a time that, you know, my instructor, I was over at Vandenberg Air Force Base when I got my private. Vandenberg, during the summertime, gets fog, a lot of it. And believe it or not, my first five hours of flight as a student was actual IFR uh, because my, my instructor, you know, they, 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 being that you're out on the base, which where the fog is there, it's a layer over the top of you. And so he would file IFR, and then of course we'd fly out of there, and so I could actually log IFR, actual IFR. The fog, you know, that does increase the humidity. And uh, even though it was mid summertime over there, and of course the temperature was cool because of the fog. So, you know, we had. So they, they got really, the Aero Club there that I was in, Vandenberg Aero Club, they were really into making sure you used carb heat. And uh, it was one of those things where I got it ingrained. But apparently it's not being ingrained by a lot of people or a lot of instructors or a lot of different places. And I don't know if it's because this is California and everybody just assumes because especially down here in Southern California, 
in this area here north of us that the humidity is low, so nobody has to worry about it. Uh, I have talked to some people, myself personally, who have said that, well, that one really wasn't ingrained in me to use carb heat a lot. In a Cessna 172, they were always taught when you pull the power back to come in, you know, when you're trying to lose altitude or go into a landing, you pull carb heat. But when you're flying from point A to point B during cruise, I've run into so many people that just absolutely sit there and go, well, I never even thought about pulling the car heat. So I'm not sure just, you know, where it's coming from in that, in that area. Well, this right here, it's very simple, very straightforward. You know, it's not something complicated, but what is a carburetor? Now, this is my definition I found that tried to make it as complicated as possible. Uh, as you see down there, I want you to memorize this, and I'm going to test you on this, you know, at the end of the class, but uh, it's a hydromechanical device employing a closed feed system from the fuel pump to the discharge nozzle. It meters through fuel through fixed jets, according to the mass airflow, through the throttle body and discharges it under a positive pressure. Pressure carburetors are distinctly different from a float type as they do not incorporate a vented float chamber or a suction pickup for discharge. Float type, which is what we have in most of our airplanes here, T-41A, the 182, and a few of the, what, the A models as far as the T-34s. Um, that's the float type. Now, let's look at a picture. Okay, this is a carburetor in case you didn't know. I don't know how many of you have really studied into this. Some of you guys I know have uh, uh, been like Bob, you know, he was raised with uh, fixing autos. Uh, but you got up there on the right hand side and I don't have my pointer. I, I, my batteries ran out. So anyhow, up there on the right hand side of the screen up there, you got where you got uh, the fuel inlet in the upper right hand corner, fuel inlet. And that's of course comes from your fuel tank and the fuel comes in through there it's metered into the tank by that ball that you see in there and ah somebody has one good <laughs> yeah well yeah, you're yeah, you're supposed to be the other half of this uh, <laughs> and uh, and so that meters how much fuel is going to go into that float in the carburetor okay now um, the mixer needle in the lower right hand corner, you know, actually the needle itself is right there and you can point to it. It's a, that's, that is your mixture, okay? That's so you can make it rich or you can make it lean. And that's how you control that. Um, it controls the flow of fuels in here. Right, comes up right through, through the, uh, the uh, discharge nozzle. Okay, now. You've got air, which is uh, how many, uh, you know, when most of you guys, when you do your pre-flight, one of the things you do is you look at that little air filter that's on the nose of the airplane just below the propeller yeah. and making sure that it's, you know, clean and no bugs are on it. Uh, well, that's where your air comes in. That's why you want to make sure it's clean because if that's clogged, obviously that's going to cause some problems here. So. Uh, the air comes up through there, comes up through the air inlet, right on up to this little place where the where you see the little walls coming in. That's a venturi. I know that most of you who's had this stuff before, you know what that is. But there are some in here that may not have a clue. So uh, because of that venturi, the air is going to now start going through faster. Okay, You mix that with the fuel. It vapor, vapor, I can't even say it, vaporizes the fuel and it goes right straight up, right into the combustion chambers uh, to be burned, okay? Your throttle is controlling that right there. Butterfly. And the butterfly. And that opens and closes depending on how much you want to add or take fuel away. Um, the Venturi effect has been something that's been used for thousands of years. Uh, uh, I was surprised to find out that even back during the Roman time, they actually, if you've seen 
like in movies or pictures where they they had places where the people that were rich sat up in little on top of their houses. They used to set up lattice work on the side and they used to have little venturis in them just like this. It actually, when the wind blew, it cooled the air down because the, and it actually brings the temperature down. Well, that's what happens here too. We'll get to that in a couple of seconds. Any questions so far on the carburetor? By the way, your car also has one of these too. And it's not fuel injection. Huh? And it's not fuel injection. Well, yeah, my, my car has got fuel injection, so. <laughs> okay, what's carb ice? Well, remember I told you about how the temperature drops? <coughs> well, this is what happens. If you're doing certain conditions, which we'll look at here in a couple of minutes, and We'll talk about that. What will happen is that the temperature will drop below freezing inside this device right here in the carburetor. It may not be like that outside. Outside the amperage temperature might be 70 degrees. It can be any temperature. It can be as we'll look at here in a minute. But what will happen, it starts building up ice like that. And of course, lo and behold, take guess what's going to happen if that starts going like this, and less fuel, less air. Uh, if you don't do anything about it, you will stall the engine. And that's something you don't want to do, unless, of course, you really are good at doing emergencies in these airplanes and landing in places that you may not want to land at. OK, this is one chart that we have here on carburetor icings, you can see there, you got the relative humidity over there on the left hand side, which is 80% to 100%. And the temperatures come up, they're showing here right around about close to 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Right up in that upper left hand corner is, is you're probably going to have a real high probability of, uh, of uh, potential icing. Notice the rest of the area. That covers quite a big range, really. That's, you can have carburetor icing almost at any time. It's one of those things that is a fact. Let's go to this one. Okay, this chart right here is really kind of a neat chart. Um, the first scenario, no, it was the second one that we talked about at the beginning. They had it was 50, let's see, what was it? It was, uh, it was actually 80 degrees, and it was 45 degrees um, uh, dew point, right in that area, right there. And that, right there, according to the legend up there, icing in glide and in cruise can happen. It doesn't say severe icing, but you can get icing. Any of that whole area that's blue, green, and of course you don't ever want to get into that red up there, because that pretty much means you will get icing. Everywhere else is just kind of, you know, you probably will. Uh, but then again, you may not. We had one individual, that this guy I told you about, that went up to Van Nuys. Actually, yeah, I think he was going up to uh, Camarillo. And he had a rough running engine. And he didn't know what it was. And so he just landed the airplane. And Bob had to go up and pick him up. And we had one of, I think it was John, that went up and picked up the airplane, I think. And it ran perfectly. And what the problem was is that if you look at the weather, the weather over here was absolutely perfect. Humidity was low. It was just, you know, nothing wrong, but he was flying towards the coast. The Camarillo, and up in that area, it's right around the coast. I mean, yeah, area. and guess what? There's the moisture, you know, it's going up. And so one thing just led to another, and he got carb ice. So don't always assume because you take off from here that everything's fine. That should be, of course, the same case when it comes to regular weather, too. You know, just for you know, a lot of people, how many people have gotten lost or crashed going from VFR to IMC? 
and flying into areas where the weather was bad. It can happen also with the carburetor ice. And it's probably more so with the carburetor because it doesn't take that much. It really doesn't. You may get it. How okay. deceiving this is, is that you can look at 90 or 100 degrees and look when you're getting some real light showers at altitude and you're still, even though the outside temperature is 90 or even 100 degrees, you're still in the icing area. And this is what takes place and fools a lot of people. It behooves you to look at the weather and check that dew point. Very much so. Now, let me see. Let me go. It can happen at any time. And we'll go into a couple of things here. Uh, the basics are, is that carburetor is a, is a product of three interrelated factors. Air temperature, relative humidity, and carburetor design. Okay? Typically, continental engines tend to ice up more than a Lycoming engine. And it has to do where how the carburetor is situated on the engine. Uh, I won't get into the details. I could if you want me to. But uh, as an example, the T41A, the old 300 D engine, is more subtle to icing than most other engines in that particular side, including the 200. So the 200 series, which we do not have, the, the O300D model, which we have in the Alphas, are very susceptible to icing because of its design. And yet 03 November, which is a Charlie model, fuel ejected, has very little icing problems. And it's by Continental also. So you just have to be aware of where you are and what you're flying to recognize that you may have issues. Any questions so far? Okay, this is a little bit of verbiage on carburetor icing, which we a lot of it we actually talked about. Um, there is one thing I do want to bring up. Let's see. I want to put this in here, but I fly the 182. Okay, I want to bring up a couple of things. For those of you who are flying fuel-injected engines, you know, for the most part, like the C model, the T41C, there is no carb ice lever in that thing at all. Okay? But that doesn't mean that you could be, you know, that you're totally clear as far as having any kind of icing at all. Now, Bob can talk about a little bit of some of the, like on the T34s especially, not so much the C model, but the T34s. There is a couple of things that you have to watch out for for those kind of engines. On the T34A, we have an alternate air that we can pull on. But in the B model being fuel injected, there is no alternate air. In the Bonanza, it has an automatic valve system that when the intake gets, becomes plugged, it overshadows the, the tension on the door and the door flops open for it internally, it's almost uh, automatic. So you have to be kind of cautious, even the T34, the two systems we have. The book calls, and if you look in the B model, it says beware of icing and what have you. If you look in the A model, it says there's an alternate air pull system. But it really doesn't talk too much because it's an older uh, thinking process when the 50s, when they built the T34, if I can use that. But you just have to be aware, if you start to lose power, you better start looking at either changing the power setting or taking to see if you've got the alternate air installed in the particular airplane you're, you're flying. So there's, there's a lot of different models around. I'm not sure what the Piper has. Um, the Bonanza works well. I don't worry about it too much because I know that door does, but I have an override. And I can override that system if I know that, and I keep watching my temperatures continue to go down, I can override the system and close that door manually. And it does work. It does work. I have been icing it with my aircraft. The wings don't work too well, but uh, the engine works pretty well, and you have to just keep oscillating that propeller to make sure you don't accumulate on that leading edge of the blades. And if you have anything, you're going to throw it off. So just be aware. 
Okay, um, and then of course what we just talked about, carburetor equipped engines are more susceptible to icing than, than fuel injected. Uh, fuel injected engines do not have a carburetor. Uh, the operating principle of float type carburetors is different, is the difference in air pressure between the venturi throat and the air inlet, which is what we just saw. The first indication of carb ice in airplanes in a fixed pitch propeller and float type carburetor is loss of RPM, which may be followed by engine roughness. I <coughs> stamp on the ground with that. I go pay attention to that. Loss of RPM. Carburetor ice is likely to form when the outside air temperature is between 20 degrees Fahrenheit and 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and there is visible moisture or high humidity. Usually, it, uh, my question would be, how do you know if it's high humidity? Okay, Robert? Okay, well that's visually, but how do you know when you're sitting in the top of the airplane? That it's, it, yeah? Pretty much feel it. I, like I said, when I used to fly out of Vandenberg, and we go out and do maneuvers above the clouds, and then we come back, and we were diving back to the back to Vandenberg. Holy smoke! You could feel. I mean, yeah, it felt like you could just feel the the humidity in the airplane, especially if you got your gas bar open. So you know, when you start feeling something like that, one of the big things about this is, you know. It, it, you know, we're always told don't fly by the seat of your pants. But I'll tell you, there's, your ears are pretty accurate, you know, if you listen to things. When I used to fly in the Air Force with a 141, I actually could tell when there was something wrong with one of the four engines by just listening. And I put my headset up against the bunk that was in the back uh, of the cockpit. And now, of course, that's a little different, but, but, but in these airplanes, when you hear that engine, I hope that you're listening to it. You know, you, you, when you're sitting there flying for any length of distance, you know, after a while, you're going to get, you know, if something changes, you'll kind of know that, especially if you're paying attention to it. Well, you should be paying attention to it as a pilot, especially the pilot in command. And, uh, of course, if you've got your cell phone, you can call up David, our mechanic, and uh, he can tell you what's wrong. But, uh, Hold your breath. Yeah. yeah. It's the but but listen to that and feel it, you know? There's things, you know, people die, I, people just don't pay attention anymore to things. But you can tell, you can listen to that airplane. The airplane does talk, believe it or not, it talks to you. And if you fly the same airplane, you know, I'm sorry to say that you can't always get the same airplane here, but we do have two T-41As. Most of you guys that fly the T-34s fly this pretty much the same one. And you have some idea or have a good familiarization with that airplane that you're flying. When the carb heat is applied to eliminate the carburetor ice in an airplane equipped with fixed pitch propeller, there will be a further decrease in RPM due to less dense hot air coming in, followed by a <coughs> gradual increase in RPM as ice melts. Um, how do you recognize the classic symptoms of carb ice is reduced power, which was what we talked about in a rough running engine. In aircraft fixed pitch propellers, the first indication is typically a small decrease in engine RPM, although the engine may still be running smoothly at this point. As ice continues to accumulate, the reduction in RPM will continue and the engine will begin to run rough. If you don't do anything about it, uh, the engine will eventually fail. But I fly the 182. The same applies to airplanes with constant speed propellers. The only difference is instead of the RPMs, it's the manifold pressure gauge. And that's what you use to see what, what happens there. Um, and of course, everybody should be in their, you know, their scanning mode of looking at the instruments.
if you're not IFR rated, then, you know, you've been taught some of that. I know, because John took up a guy the other day and was uh, doing that, and so was Jerry. Uh, just get to know what the airplane is like. The cure, apply fuel heat. The first indication of carb ice, i.e. lowering of the RPMs, running rough, full carb heat on, okay? No, that wasn't a misspelling. It's not pull carb heat, it's full carb heat. In other words, no partial carb heat. Pull it all the way out in the Cessnas. I think Piper has a lever. You want to do full heat. Um, now, the other big one. Why don't we just expand on that a little bit, Roger? And what takes place in the engine when, when you have carburetor ice and you do pull carburetor heat? You know, what's taking place with the engine thereafter? Be a good question to see if anybody has any answers. It doesn't run on water. So the engine's going to run even rougher probably for a few minutes. Oh, yeah. Until it dissipates and it, it allows that uh, airflow to increase. And then as it gets down and sublimates, then the engine goes back up to power. But it takes time for that, that heat to take and, and heat not only the carburetor, because it's, it's had ice on it, so the carburetor's cold, but it has to heat the carburetor to get rid of the ice. So the engine's going to start running rougher, and you're going to worry about it, and then you're going to push the heat in because you think that's making it worse? No, you have to leave it out. One of the scenarios that I had in here was that the guy, you know, uh, there was a student flying with his instructor for about three hours. They were out flying uh, in uh, Ohio, and approach control told him to experience that he was. Ex they told him that he was experiencing partial power loss and requested to land at Mansfield runway three two. Apparently, the passenger was the one that survived the crash, but the passenger said he pulled carb heat for about 10 seconds and then pushed it back in again. So that's, you know, uh, like I said, I was ingrained with using carb heat. It doesn't hurt anything to leave that thing out if you have any doubts whatsoever. And that's one of the things we'll show here. Leave it on until normal engine power returns. Monitor engine power and reapply carb heat as necessary. Remember, when carb heat is applied, the warm air will inherently cause a reduction in engine power because the, the, the air um, uh, becomes less dense. Yeah. Carb heat. Okay, carb heat is an anti-ice system, which is uh, interesting, uh, that preheats the air before it reaches the carburetor. Okay, and it's intended to keep the fuel-air mixture above freezing temperature to prevent formation of carb ice. As you can see in the picture there, you got the ice breaking up, and of course that's going to cause your, your uh, roughness in the engine because it doesn't run on, on you know, there's a reason why you pogo the, the fuel, to make sure there's no water in it. Uh, it's so that you don't have any water. So this right here will show you if you use that, your engine's going to run a little rough because it doesn't like water. And that's a car. That's an actual carb heat. I should have David come up and explain this one. But you got the air scoop up there on the right hand side, and uh, and of course the lever. Right there should be the the, the uh, uh, fuel heat, and then of course you got manifold pressure, uh, the manifold air is going in through that hole there, which heats up the uh, the uh, carburetor. Sometime, whenever I suggest that if you really want to look at this kind of stuff, you can go down where Dave and ask David if he could, if you could go in there and look at the stuff when he has the tailings off the airplane. Um, it's okay yeah it's fascinating you know that kind of stuff it really is 
carb heat uh, enriches the fuel oil mixture and because warm air is less dense than the cold air, when the air density decreases because the air is warm, the fuel mixture ratio becomes richer uh, since there is less air for the same amount of fuel. Applying carb heat uh, decreases engine output and increases operating temperature. Any questions so far? Any confusion? Anybody don't know a thing that I'm talking about? <laughs> oh, Dr. Foster, I'm sorry, you, you rose your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, many engine failures was because it sounded like ice was gone, so they turned the fuel lead off. At first indication of carb heat, apply full carburetor heat and leave it on. Uh, can't overemphasize that. Remember, I one of my biggest pet peeves in here is, or not pet peeves, one of my biggest things I 